Okay, our next talk is uh, Mike Stewart uh, from Sequent, and he's, uh, he's going to talk about a revolution. Good afternoon. I'm sorry, I have to uh, leave my glasses on so you're all a bit fuzzy. Um, yeah, so first of all, I want to, uh, to just ask you a question. How many people in the room have worked on resource estimations directly? Or oh, a large chunk, great. Okay, some of you may recognise what I'm about to, uh, to, to work our way through. So what I'd first like to do is sort of set the scene a little bit. So you've just been given a new job. You've, uh, you've applied for a job with Blue Skies Mining, um, been given a job as a resource geologist, and uh, you've been tasked with updating the 2018 resource estimate. It was last updated in 2017. So you start looking, uh, and somebody gives you the resource report. That's a good start. Um, but you open the resource report and you find that it's only half complete. Uh, and then you find out that the previous resource geologist apparently left under a bit of a cloud, something to do with inappropriate res uh, internet access. Um, so you, at that stage, go digging. And, and someone points you towards the directory where um, it's likely that the previous estimate was done. So you dig into this directory a little bit. Um, at this stage, you're starting to have to do a bit of detective work. Detective work. So you're starting to feel a little bit like this person on the first day on the job. OK, so here's something. You're not intended to be able to read this. Here's a, a fairly typical project directory uh, from a unnamed resource estimation software. Um, so you look into this directory. You're not familiar with this software. You haven't used this one before. Mm. But you better try and work out what's been done. So there's a whole bunch of files in there that look like drill hole files once you ask around. Okay, there's lots of them. Uh, some of them given fairly enigmatic names, 6.3 naming conventions, for example. Uh, there's a bunch of parameter files, um, which you can sort of get some idea about what maximum sample numbers means. Um, but you're not really familiar with how it's been implemented. You've got a whole lot of, uh, which ones are these? CSV files, all different types of CSV files. Uh, there seems to be input data, there's output data, there's block models, there's parameter files, there's all sorts of stuff in there you've really got not much idea about. The naming's fairly ambiguous. Uh, there's a whole bunch of data transfer files. Um, so other data transfer, these are spatial DXF files. Lots and lots of different files related to things like pit surfaces and geology solids apparently and oxidation surfaces. Um, things have slipped a little bit there, but uh, what else have we got? Uh, Okay, that was the DXFs. You eventually find a block model in the directory. That's a good start. It's named .tmp. <laughs> so you dig down into a subdirectory and you find uh, eventually a model that looks like it's called December 2017, DES 17 or something along those lines. So you open it up, you dig into the geometry folders uh, and find a bunch of geometries that appear to relate to the resources. We open them up together once you've found the survey so they can convert them into the new software of your choice. Um, and then they don't quite match. Uh, you find the polygons that the surfaces were built from or the solids were built from, they don't quite match either. At this stage you're thinking you might just start again. So that's not an uncommon situation for a lot of people who've been involved in resource estimation at some point. If anyone's done any due diligence or auditing, often data rooms will look a little bit like that as well. So I guess a lot of the current systems are based around a Firebase architecture. This is one of the issues that we have, uh, one, sorry, one of the legacies, I suppose, of the, of the software. Um, you generally have input data files, parameter files, uh, and output block model files of some sort. That's, that's sort of the general architecture, which are linked generally by scripting or macros, which are dependent on the user to uh, to define. So the process is very reliant on good housekeeping, on use of consistent naming and paths um, and naming conventions. Um, you're reliant on things like external archiving techniques, so zip files are very common throughout resource estimation. Uh, you really do need good documentation to follow what's going on because it's not, you can't generally uh, untangle it from the files. Um, it's not, not to say that some, there's not some good practice around. People have evolved good practices uh, around you know, archiving and these things, but they are dependent on, these, uh, on, on good housekeeping and good documentation. Um, there's also a high level of user skill required in a lot of the softwares. 
um, it, particularly in scripting and macros. And when you've got high skill levels, what does that create? Oh, sorry, we're going, well, that's the next slide. Does any of this sound familiar, that, that you've overwritten files uh, inadvertently? Um, that you've applied rotations incorrectly or found rotations applied incorrectly? Um, that you find errors in the scripts? Uh, typos, decimals, things that were just a plain old typo? That there's logic errors in the implementation of the, the software? Um, it wasn't doing exactly what you thought it was doing? Um, that the help files are not often very helpful? Uh, and that you've got tech support on the speed dial. Most people don't have speed dial anymore, but you know what I mean. That you have a good relationship with your, the, your vendors. So what does it create? It creates gatekeepers. So the New Zealand Tourist Board pay me to put this in, of course. <laughs> um, and also very high barriers to entry. So um, one of the primary skills required of a resource estimation geologist is knowledge of the software rather than necessarily knowledge of the process that you're trying to manage. Um, and is that desirable? I mean, um, it does create the situation where it means that people generally are experienced in resource estimation by the time they get to making them. Uh, at least they've been inducted into the process of, of running the software. Uh, and York does demand that you have five years of relevant experience in the, the commodity of your choice. Um, but really, running the software uh, shouldn't be one of the key criteria for whether you uh, are good at, at the, process, the practice of resource estimation. So is your gatekeeper a, a, a friendly wizard, a, a wise mentor, or someone who spends their time down in the leaf litter, uh, or someone who's a bit power hungry? So what if? What if resource estimation software was, was easy and intuitive to use and was workflow based? So take away the gatekeepers. Um, that means that you should be able to focus then, or users should be able to focus on the outputs uh, and what they mean, and on the, the statistical validity, for example, of the, the process or the other parts of the process that reflect, that, that affect resource estimation. Imagine if it didn't require scripting, so that's something else you don't have to learn. It means you take away implementation errors. A number of times as an as a, uh, auditor that I found errors in implementation um, that weren't known, or I've gone back to sites and found the same scripts being used 18 years later. Um, so if you can remove scripting, that's possibly a good thing. Um, and imagine if your resource estimation software is dynamic, that if you add data, that it flows through the update of the geology, through into the update of the resource estimates, and then the task becomes to see what's the impact of adding this data, does it change things, and are the parameters I've chosen, the models I've chosen, and the the method I've chosen, are they still appropriate? Do I need to modify anything on the basis of the output? Or am I happy that my previous assumptions are okay, tickety-boo, in which case I can move on into the process, further into the process? Okay. So what we've been working on is a, um, a workflow-based approach to resource estimation. Um, this is a, a product that's been out for about just over a year. Um, it uses the concept of a domain estimation object, which in essence links together the domain, the data, the interpolation method, uh, the variogram models, um, provides uh, analysis of the boundary and the boundary conditions that you might like to apply, um, gives you access to declustering uh, or, or spatial data density, um, and a search strategy all within a single object that's linked together. Um, that's the tree on the right is what it looks like. Um, so these domain estimations are set up per domain per variable uh, and they can be then combined uh, and then evaluated onto whatever sort of block model you want, so whatever output you want. Effectively, it's a, it manages the parameters and the choices within an estimation object. Just a very poor visual. Um, I mean, this is effectively uh, happening in the 3D graphic environment. Um, but just showing the idea, there's a domain which is in pale behind. Um, the, the data within that domain, so that's uh, very visual. The variography within that, or the variogram model within that, um, and a search strategy within that as well. Then evaluate that onto a block model. Um, 
The validation process then is, uh, I guess, there's a lot of the, in my experience, a lot of what's evolved as practice for validation is actually checking for implementation errors, not checking for statistical validity. Uh, if you eliminate implementation error, then you don't need to worry about making those checks. Um, we've included swath plots, uh, mainly because everyone wants them, but I would ask you to have a little think about what a swath plot actually tells you. It matches input data and output data in some sort of smooth way. It, that's all it's doing. It's really not telling you anything about the validity of the choices that you've made during that process. It's become de facto standard, but I, you know, I, I think we should really think hard about that as a, as a, in our industry, about whether that's good practice or not. Um, there's a, an idea of uh, what's called block status, which is the picture at the top, um, which lets you see very quickly, for example, um, if uh, a block was estimated or not estimated, if it had an error, um, if, uh, so the validity of the block estimates, where's missing, if you need to increase your search to, to fill towards the margins, if you've done multiple passes, uh, which pass is informing which block. Um, so the, the, the validation um, is, or visual validation is very powerful in this regard and I guess um, we're working on the statistical validations. Um, that's first step first, we've got to uh, get the, the, the workflow process nailed down first and then we'll move in, and develop more sophisticated tools around that. Um, there's a block calculation engine that lies underneath so I just want to, um, I guess, stitch together what we're thinking um, in terms of, uh, of, of how the, the components of the software are working together. Um, we have, I'm not sure if people are familiar with, with LeapFrog Geo, it's a geometric, oh, it's geometry modelling package, um, so for producing uh, domains, and well, volumes, I should say, um, including uh, estimation domains. Um, built forward from the data, so it's dynamic. Um, edge. Uh, is a module or can stand alone on top of um, the, the resource modelling. Um, and those are linked, so they can be either just directly linked uh, on a, in a desktop or they can be linked um, into via a, a central server. Um, so this can be either uh, site or locally hosted or cloud hosted. Um, the difference with central as a server is that it's not just a, st it's a storage receptacle for models, but it's a storage receptacle that manages versioning. Um, so you don't just copy a model up there, you publish to it. Um, so it becomes version controlled. You can revert to previous versions if you want. You can track, it, it tracks all the information of the project, so you can, the, the decisions are embedded within that. Um, becomes a single source of truth that other people can access. Um, for example, head office or the mining engineers or surveyors or whoever else has, wants to have access to those uh, to those models. Um, it benefits from the fact it's live, um, so you can easily add and update data um, so that the, the time for updating your models is much quicker. Um, gives confidence in the process um, and makes for collaborative work um, so other people can, can contribute to, the, to what's published and read and access what's published. So we're thinking of this as kind of a, a wrapped up solution, these um, software blocks together. Um, just to, to give you the idea of central, I'll show you a couple of very quick pictures. Um, so that the idea is uh, that there's a tree on the left-hand side, like a cactus. Um, that manages the versions temporally. Um, you can annotate those with all sorts of metadata. Um, so generally, I'll just point out that within the industry, we do a pretty good job of managing raw data. So drill holes are almost invariably stored in relational databases with QC and um, metadata associated. Our resource models almost invariably are not stored that way at all. Just zooming in a little bit, um, you get the idea. Um, so just to show you what that looks like, uh, across the bottom there's a series of tabs. So this is pulling a model back um, from, uh, from central server um, and just stepping through temporally, say three updates of the model, um, and you can go forward and back at, and pull up any date that it was published. So you can see what was changed. But do we really want to be democratising model making and uh, opening up the process to people who aren't gatekeepers? Um, I guess the question really is, you know, is the driver responsible for crashing a car or is the car responsible for crashing itself? Um, so there's a few, I guess, examples that you can think of over history. Um, 
just casting back to Martin Luther and the, uh, the German Bible. Um, so as an example of gatekeeping, the, uh, the development of the, the common language version of the Bible was to allow people to communicate directly uh, rather than having to be mediated through uh, Latin-speaking versions of the Bible and the, uh, the Catholic Church. Uh, and he was particularly motivated by the, the payment of indulgences. Um, so what the, the, uh, the Luther Bible did was open up uh, religion to everybody, to the common person. Um, and it's possibly showing my age, but uh, when I was a child, we had a manual telephone exchange. So the position of uh, telephon telephonic operator doesn't exist anymore. It's uh, one of those consigned to, the, to history. So in conclusion, I guess the, what we're trying to see here, to, to show here is that we think that the revolution that's required in resource estimation is not development of ever more complicated algorithms. It's about providing uh, solutions which are a lot easier to use, which allow people to focus on the geology, the modelling, uh, and the outputs uh, without having to be bound by the process. So where to next? We've got a bunch of things on the development um, uh, list, so we, a few things we need to do. For anyone who knows the software, I guess um, we, we know we need to improve our block modelling, that uh, at the moment the concept of a single domain needs to be extended into dealing with multiple domains. One of the reasons for scripting, of course, is to deal with complex domain uh, variable combinations. Um, to work on improved validations, uh, to provide better uh, data analysis tools. Um, we're looking at how we provide access to advanced estimation methods. Um, what our preferred solution probably is to open up the, uh, the power of algorithms that other people are, are developing um, and provide access to, to cloud-based computing you know, for, for heavy things like simulation. Thank you, Mike.